I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 is our text today. As we're continuing our study in the book of Romans, we're just walking through chapter by chapter, uh, looking at it, learning from it, uh, and discovering what God has for us. If uh, you're here and you don't have a Bible, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,125, and you will find our text for the day. That's 1,125. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you need one, you want one, then please take one of these with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know that if you do that, then God will change your life. Uh, Hey, by the way, happy Labor Day weekend. Uh, You guys thrilled with it? (laughs) Woohoo, yeah. (laughs) You know what? That's exactly how I feel. Can I just tell you that out of all the holidays that are on the calendar, Labor Day is my least favorite holiday? I I think it's because of the trauma from childhood. Uh, Because I had, uh, let me just say this, I had parents who lied to me. (laughs) Maybe some of you guys did too. You know, because it's Labor Day weekend and I go, great, what are we going to do? And my parents go, we're going to do chores. We're going to clean out the garage. We've got projects to do. We're going to fix things all weekend long. And I go, but we get out of school. And my parents actually told me this. They said, you got out of school so you could work around the house. Because <laughs> what's the name of the holiday? Yeah. yeah, see, and that's wrong. So parents, don't do that. If you were scarred like I am, therapy works. Uh, so... So anyway, uh, this is Labor Day weekend. It's not a day set aside so you can do chores around the house. I am not going to be spending my Labor Day doing that, I'll just tell you. Uh, Does anybody actually know the history of Labor Day, of when it was started? Yeah, I didn't think so. I didn't. I looked it up. So uh, Labor Day was established as a national holiday in 1894 to honor workers. That, that's to celebrate the American worker and the contribution they have to our society. And uh, so now you know. And you're thrilled. Just, just the same. I can see that. Uh, all your faces. So, you know, since it's history, how many of you love history? How many of you love to read history and study history and learn from history and all that kind of stuff? How many of you are history nuts? Okay, a lot of hands go up. How many of you slept through history class in high school? <laughs> yeah, a lot more hands go up. So, uh, Great, because some of you are going to love this sermon, and the rest I hope you'll stay awake for at least a few minutes. Uh, Romans chapters 9 through 11, we've been uh, looking at this, and we're wrapping this section of Romans up. It it really does uh, a deep dive into the historical relationship between God and Israel as a nation, and then how that relates to us. Uh, But at the same time, there's some amazing practical truths to share out of chapter 11. But first, allow me to cover the history. Allow me to cover the history. I've got to walk through this, and so we're going to walk through the chapter, and we're going to look at the history real briefly. So uh, again, those of you who slept through history class, I uh, hope this doesn't bore you too much. Uh, Romans chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, I'm going to read the first 10 verses. Uh, Paul says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to Baal. By the way, if you want to read that story, that's 1 Kings 18 and 19. Uh, so too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and bend their backs forever. Okay, some some history here. Israel was chosen to be God's people. Okay? Uh, The patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes. It's a story found in Genesis. If you want to read that, read the whole book. Uh, And then Moses came along on the scene and they have the Exodus event where God 
took the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and established them as a nation. That's the book of Exodus uh, all the way through Deuteronomy. And, and, uh, and so God revealed himself to the Jews and he revealed himself through the Jews. So Israel was chosen to be God's people and then Israel rejected Jesus. You see, Jesus came into his own And his own received him not. They rejected him. And we're talking about saying they rejected him. The nation rejected him. The religious leaders rejected him. Uh, As a whole, they didn't say, hey, this is the Messiah. We're going to follow him. Now, some of them did. They were the remnant. Like Elijah, the 7,000 who who believed. uh, Because the first 20 years of the church, it was entirely Jewish in, in, in terms of its demographic. I mean, there's a, you know, like one or two Gentiles that came in, but the 99% of the church was Jewish in its orientation. And, and it wasn't until later that the Gentiles began to come in. So uh, that, that's where the history begins. Israel's chosen to be God's people. Israel rejected Jesus. And then Gentiles were included as God's people. And Paul continues writing to us then. Verse 11, he says, so I ask. Did they, the Israelites, stumble in order that they might fall? By no means, rather through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I am speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to somehow make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you remember, if you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say branches are broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too can be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? You guys didn't know you were branches, did you? A bunch of olive horticulture there. But uh, the message is this. Gentiles were included as God's people. God always intended to include us into his family. God always wanted Israel to represent him to the nations to bless the world through Israel. And of course, God did. Jesus came into the world as a Jewish boy in a Jewish family, and he is the Messiah and the Savior. And because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we are included in God's family by faith. Now, just a couple of observations. First of all, appreciate your heritage. Did you catch that? Appreciate your heritage. We were grafted into a living, breathing tree, and we are part of that because we were added into it, which means that, uh, that we're part of something that's bigger than us. You ever heard the term Judeo-Christian ethic? It, it, it means that, that we share this common root with uh, Judaism. That the Old Testament, the, you know, the first half of the book, really it's more than half, uh, we share. So we have common history, we have common stories, common heroes up until the point of Jesus. And then the paths diverge. So appreciate your heritage. Understand that. Um, And historically, people haven't valued that and respected their Jewish faith heritage. And so the Jews have been persecuted throughout history by people who should have celebrated the heritage they shared. And can I just say this? Anti-Semitism is evil. And all racism is evil. If you're looking at people and judging them and hating them because they're different than you... That's not of God ever. 
So appreciate your heritage. And did you notice this? We're included in God's family by grace. By grace. We don't deserve it. We're not included in God's family because we're good people or because we're Americans or because of who your grandparents were, your parents were. Uh, (laughs) This is really fun, but I don't know if you noticed this, but he talked about how it's unnatural for us to be included in God's family. We've been unnaturally grafted in. And I don't know anything about horticulture. I don't care anything about horticulture, but I know this. A wild olive branch is not supposed to be grafted into a cultivated, cultured uh, one. But we are. And here's the thing. I don't care if I got in unnaturally as long as I'm in. So, uh, you know, but it's, it's not natural. But I don't care. I don't really, doesn't matter to me. I'm used to being weird. So... So here's the other thing. Uh, So we see that the Gentiles are included as God's people, and then Israel will be included again. Verse 25, Paul continues. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience... So they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may also now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. So Israel's going to be included again. See, God's promise is that he's going to save all of his people, Jews and Gentiles. But Paul also talks about a future action of God to redeem the Jewish people. And and I'm just going to tell you, there's a lot of different viewpoints about this in Christendom. How that's going to play out, what that means. And and as we've been talking about this last month or so, there's a lot of different viewpoints in Christendom about uh, lots of subjects. But people who love Jesus and love Scripture and are committed to the mission of Christ can disagree. So... Just to boil it down, the simplest understanding, and this is where I'm at, is that God has a plan and a purpose, and that one day a spiritual awakening is going to happen among the Jews. Now, it was really interesting. I'd already written the sermon, and I traveled to China last week, and I came across a book written by Chinese pastors who have spent decades in prisons in China. And uh, they believe that God's going to use Chinese Christians to reach the, the last of the people who are, far, who are far from God, who don't know about God, and bring about revival in Israel. And their dream is to send 100,000 Chinese missionaries around the world. Isn't that amazing? And, and see, I, I didn't know that. I got over there, and I see this book, and I'm like, this is really cool. But here's the thing. There's, there's probably more Chinese Christians in China than there are Christians in America. God is at work in his world, and he's doing great things. And we don't know how it's all going to play out, but at the end, God's going to do something amazing in Israel once again. So that's the history stuff. Got to cover that because Paul's writing about this in this great historical theology. Uh, So now let's get personal. Let's get personal. There's some definite applications to our lives that uh, are in the midst of this. So here here are some of them. First of all, uh, I got to ask the question, have you embraced Jesus. Have you embraced Jesus? Because in verse 32, it says, For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Have you experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you surrendered to him? Have you come to that place in your life where you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world? And you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead. And you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Because Paul doesn't want you to miss that. He says because everybody's been disobedient, everybody is a sinner and needs the grace of God. By the way, it's one of our essential doctrines here at Calvary. We believe that everybody is a sinner and everybody needs God's grace. Without it, we have no hope. So, and notice from this chapter, it doesn't matter who your parents or your grandparents were. 
doesn't matter what they believed or what they did. It doesn't matter your nationality or your ethnicity. The only thing that matters is you following Jesus as Savior and Lord. And Paul doesn't want anybody to miss out on the grace of God. And, and he already said it extensively in this chapter. Verse 6, he said, look, it's by grace. If it's by works, then grace doesn't matter. But it's not by works. And, and I don't want anybody sitting here thinking, you know, hey, I'm a good person, and I'm trying hard, and I think I'm going to be okay. No, you're not a good person, and you may be trying really hard, but you're going to fail and we don't want you to fail. We want you to come face to face with Jesus and understand that the only way you're going to have eternal life is by surrendering to him, inviting him to have control of your life, calling on him as Lord. So have you done that? Because that's the message that Paul wants every person to get. He wants Jews and Gentiles alike to know Jesus and receive mercy. And then... There is the warning against pride. There's a warning, huge warning in this chapter, really. It, it's a tragedy story of pride. Verse 18, he says, Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Verse 20, he says, They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith, so do not become proud, but fear. The, the, the whole story of this chapter is about the, the pride of the, the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders rejected Jesus because of pride. I, I mean, he came and, and stood in front of them as the Messiah, as God incarnate, and, and they were the people who, were, who God had revealed himself to, and they rejected the Messiah. Why? Because the Messiah challenged the way that they were thinking. And they thought they were right. And Jesus was wrong. And they were special, and they were chosen, and so they were proud. They were proud of their relationship with God, even though their ancestors killed the prophets. They were still proud. They didn't care. They were proud of their righteousness. They kept the law, at least the important parts to them. And they looked down on the Gentiles who didn't know the law. They looked down on the common Jewish people who didn't keep the law, and they thought that they were better than them. So they were proud. They were proud of their heritage. They were proud of their history. They were proud of their lifestyle. They were just proud. Even though they studied Scripture and knew what Scripture said about pride. Like God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Like pride goes before destruction. So I have to ask you today. Is there pride in your life? Is there pride in your life that believes that you really are better than others? Not everybody, but some. Is there pride in your life that believes you have the right to judge and condemn others because you've got some things figured out? Is there pride in your life that boasts in what you can do, what you can accomplish, what you've done? Is there pride that gets angry when you're challenged? Or jealous when others succeed or are recognized and you're not. God opposes the proud. God gives grace to the humble. And today I want to challenge you to choose humility. Choose humility. Um, I'm just going to confess that, that pride is that great sin in my life that I have to repent of every day. Every single day. I, I have to try and kill the pride that's in my life. And a lot of times, multiple times throughout the day, because it plagues me. And I know some of you are shocked because you thought the sin that I fight every day is gluttony. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't fight that nearly as much as I do pride. I, I probably should. But, uh, but see, here's the thing. Uh, I, I try to choose humility, even though naturally I don't want to choose humility because humility is hard, because I want to live my life unopposed by God. And God opposes the proud. I don't ever want to put myself in a place where I know that God is against me. And yet the natural urge that's within me and within you is pride. And a lot of you are sitting here today and you struggle with pride whether you realize it or not. You know that urge that tells you that you're right and everybody else is wrong? That's pride. 
And there's some of you sitting here who can't admit that you're wrong. There's some of you that would rather win every argument and lose the relationship, and pride is oozing out of your pores and killing your relationships and destroying your family. There are some of you that are proud and and to the point where you won't ask for help even when you need it. And you're like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to handle this, I'm not going to be a burden to other people, and that's pride. And you're hurting yourself and you're hurting your family, you're hurting your friends because you won't let anyone help you. You see, there's pride in our lives, and I know this because uh, I lost a battle to it last week. Yeah, I was in Beijing. Uh, We were there trying to set up some partnerships so that we could, uh, you know, take some trips in the future and go and see if we can't build the kingdom uh, there. And I'm meeting with the pastor of the the Beijing International Christian Fellowship. It's a really cool church that uh, uh, meets there that it it does ministry to foreigners that live in Beijing. And uh, they have about 3,500 people that meet in like eight different congregations, different languages and cultures and stuff really cool uh, setup. So we worshiped there on Sunday, and then I was meeting with the pastor on Tuesday, and we're meeting at a Starbucks right by where their their church meets, and so uh, I thought I knew how to get there. Yeah, I'm riding alone on the Beijing subway, but I'd been there, so I thought I know how to get there. And I had the thought, I should probably confirm uh, the subway stop to get off on. I had the thought, I did not follow through on the action, because I'm right. And I know I'm right. And so I boldly and courageously got off at the wrong subway stop in a city that I don't speak the language, in a place I'd never been before. And I knew that when I walked off the subway and I looked around and I went, I haven't been here. This is not a good feeling. I had 30 minutes to get to the meeting uh, because I wanted to be there early so uh, because I knew I didn't know where I was going exactly. And thankfully, my phone's map app, uh, you know, app worked. And so I pulled it up and realized I am one and a half miles from the Starbucks I'm supposed to be meeting them at. And, uh, and I've got 30 minutes. I can make it on foot. So I started following the little arrow on the map. <laughs> Just followed it down here. I've got to turn here now. So I turned, and I followed it, and I made it there. But I had to walk, and I had to walk briskly. It's a mile and a half. It's 90 degrees. It's about 90% humidity. And I was a sweaty, stinking mess when I arrived. <laughs> Why? Because pride told me I didn't need to ask for help. I was right, and I knew I was right, except I was a proud idiot. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble, so the challenge for us is to choose humility, and and yet that's never a natural thing. We have to fight for humility, and pride is, is what sunk the Jewish leaders And we don't want it to sink our lives. So what do we do? How do we choose humility? Well, first of all, decide that you're going to live kindness. Decide that you're going to live kindness. Uh, The Apostle Paul wrote a lot of stuff about kindness. Like in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, love is patient and love is kind. If we're going to love, then we've got to be kind. Uh, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Kindness is evident that God the Holy Spirit is in you and he's ruling your life, not just visiting. Kindness is simply choosing to treat people as if their life is equally as important as yours. Their life is as important as yours, by the way. But it's you deciding that you're going to treat people that way. That their time is just as valuable as your time. And their energy is just as valuable as your energy. And their priorities are just as valuable as your priorities. And you're going to give them that respect and treat them that way. The Apostle Paul summarized this in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, when he said, Do nothing, absolutely nothing, from selfish ambition or empty conceit. But rather, with humility of mind, consider others more important than yourself. Do not merely look after your own interests, but also the interests of others. In other words, it's not just about you and what you need to do, what you need to get accomplished in your day and your schedule and your priorities and your agenda. It is about us. So when you look at people, do you see them as being just as valuable as you are in your life before God? 
Because if we live kindness, it'll change our relationships in our homes. We'll have a lot less arguments and fights, and battles. If, if you live kindness, it'll change uh, the atmosphere at your job at, and the restaurants that you visit, the stores and places of business, at your kids' sporting events. It'll change the way you drive. It's a real test right there. See, but what happens is if we live kindness is that God's grace will overflow in our lives and you'll be amazed at God's power in your life. Because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Get grace by living kindness and then get grace by practicing gratitude. Practice gratitude. You know, pride doesn't usually say thank you because it's too busy taking the credit. Be grateful. The Apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you who are in Christ Jesus. If you ever said, I want to know what God wants me to do, he wants you to be thankful. Be grateful. Recognize the blessings in your life. And, and we focus on so many things that, and complain about so many things but be grateful. You know, gratitude looks like, it, it's recognizing that, that there is nothing in me that qualifies me to be the pastor of Calvary. And yet it is a privilege, it is an honor, it is a blessing from God that he allows me to do this, knowing that I don't deserve it. See, gratitude is recognizing that all the good in your life comes from God, and it is constantly thanking him for that for the relationships that bless you, for the blessings that fill your life. And, and, and I don't understand how we can ever be ungrateful because we are so incredibly blessed. And if you struggle to see how blessed you are, can I just encourage you in the future, sign up for one of the mission trips we're taking out of this country and see how the world lives. Because if nothing else, you'll come home and give thanks to God for this country and the blessings that you have. So, Practice gratitude, live kindness, and point people to mercy. Point people to mercy. If you're going to really live in humility or pursue humility, you've got to point people to mercy because that's what Paul did with his life. Uh, he realized that God's mission was more important than his own plans and his own desires. Let me say that again. Paul realized that God's mission was more important than what he wanted to do with his life. See, a lot of us, we, we just want what we want. And we want God to bless it. And so we, we say, here's my plans, here's my dreams, here's my hopes, here's what I'm going to do. God, I hope that's okay with you. That's not what humility does. You know what humility does? Humility says, God, what are your plans for my life? What do you want me to do with my time? What do you want me to do with my resources? What do you want me to do with my passions so that I can glorify your name? And we already know what God wants us to do. He wants us to point people to Jesus because he wants people to experience mercy and life and hope beyond this world. As your pastor, I want you to choose humility because I know that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. And I want you receiving God's grace. Finally, in this passage, we see that God is beyond our capacity to fully comprehend. The apostle ends with this wonderful refrain, verse 33 through 36. He says, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to God that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be glory forever. Amen. Paul concludes this section of the letter by acknowledging that there are some truths that just don't make any sense to us. There are some things that we're not ever going to understand this side of eternity. And, 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 well, God put it this way, Isaiah 55, 9. He says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. God is telling us, hey, guys, I, I can't explain it all to you because you you're not going to grasp it. 
And, and that's what Paul is saying. Look, God's beyond our, comp- our, our capacity to fully comprehend. How, how many of you have ever had a conversation with a toddler? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Conversations with toddlers are great, right? Especially we're in, when they're in the why stage. Because you can tell them something and they just ask why. And you tell them something else and then they just, you know, ask why. And sometimes with my, you know, almost three-year-old grandson, when he says why, I just give him the actual answer. You know, I explain it all to him. And then at the end of that, he'll say, oh, thank you, grandfather, for explaining it to me. Now I fully understand it. (laughs) Yeah. No, he doesn't say that, does he? What does he say? Why? Because he can't comprehend it. God is our Father, and we are His children, and sometimes we come to Him and ask why. Sometimes He doesn't answer us because we can't understand, and sometimes He gives us an answer, and we still can't understand. And we just ask why. So can I encourage you, and can the Apostle Paul encourage you, that when you cannot understand, that you still trust the God of mercy? See, here's the thing. We, we may not be able to understand the why, but if we hold on to God's hand and we get to know him better and we keep talking with him and walking with him and growing with him, some things will happen. Eventually, we'll understand more of the whys. We'll actually begin to understand the heart and mind of God. The other thing that will happen is there's some things that will go, hey, you know what? I don't understand it, but I trust God. God completely because he loves me and he's given me grace when I didn't deserve it and he's with me and he won't leave me and one day I'm going to celebrate in eternity with him so can I just encourage you to trust God when you don't understand because he's proven that he loves you in Christ let's pray